Hi everybody, I'm Carrie O'Neill and we are in uh, one of the spare bedrooms in my home at 2.19 in the morning making videos about how we have spawned corals here in my house. We're going to talk a little about how, about how we got to this point and unveil the species that we're working with and talk a little bit about what's happened over the last couple nights and what we're hoping for for the future. All right, so we're here at my house at 2.19 in the freaking morning on a Thursday to talk Friday. about it's now Friday. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you for pointing that out, smart ass. Uh, talk about coral spawning and how we got here. Basically, this all started as a conversation at Shane's house um, with Shane, myself, and Richard talking about how we could do coral spawning work that would actually benefit the hobby and be good for conservation and what species would be the best. You know, I've been working with Atlantic corals for so long, I'm a little out of touch with the hobby. So I don't know what species are in the most conservation need or what's still being wild collected versus aquacultured or maricultured. I'm not really familiar with that nowadays. So. You went to Shane and Richard to say, hey, like, I'd love to spawn corals at home. And, you know, we came up with the target species that night and kind of jumped right into, okay, let's try to make this happen. We, we met up with Chris and Amanda Meckley from ACI, who are also really interested in coral spawning. They donated some brood stock to the project. Shane sourced some brood stock for the project. Part of the early thing was we were working with a species where we know nothing. So we don't know when it spawns. We don't know if it's a hermaphrodite or a gonochore. Is it gonna release bundles of eggs and sperm? Like you just know nothing, nothing. There's nothing in the scientific literature. I, I looked, there's just nothing at all. Um, so you're working with a blank slate. You've got 365 days a year and one of them is going to be the day that it's going to spawn. But what we did was take corals given to us by ACI and preserved them in formalin. So as much as it's painful to take a beautiful acanthophilia there, it's out of the, it's out of the box to take a acanthophilia that might retail for a thousand dollars and cut it up on a griffin saw into a bunch of pie pieces and drop them in a tub of formalin. That's what we did. And then once that tissue gets preserved, I brought it back here to the house. So this is actually what those pie pieces of one of those original acanthophilia looks like. And you can see it still has the skeleton on it, but there's a technique we use in coral science for histology to check for egg development where you can decalcify this skeleton and then just get left with this soft tissue. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty interesting, I think. You think it's interesting? Oh yeah. You know That's what you're looking piece? at? It's uh, sexy. It is sexy. So we have a little pie slice of acanthophilia. So then we Melt dropped it, it Melt, in an, a dilute hydrochloric acid solution that has some other stuff in it. I have some clips of that and that skeleton melts away. So you end up with just the soft tissue. So all that skeleton is gone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the most, like in my opinion, like it's so interesting because it's like layered. Yeah, so the, the ridges that you're seeing in it are the tissue that is in between each individual septa of the skeleton. So the skeleton has these hard septa that radiate out from the mouth. The now, same ones that cut the flesh. Exactly. The same ones that have those big um, septal teeth that you see in acanthophilia that stick up, that make them sensitive to shipping because they'll rip through the flesh. And that's all gone now. So then I, I looked at this individual one. This one's from 1021. So October 21st is when we preserved this. Looked at it under the microscope and was like, oh boy, there's a bunch of eggs in there. So that right there was the first bit of information we had about how 
and when this coral might spawn. I called Shane and was like, you know that tank we've been talking about for a little while now? Like, we need to build it. And he's like, oh yeah, like by when? I'm like, by Monday. <laughs> so he came up like Friday and with the, all the equipment. Go ahead, you can tell this part of the story. So I brought two 80 gallon frag tanks. We connected those together into one sump, mm -hmm. a couple of power heads, a couple of light fixtures, a couple of heaters from CJ, a couple of pumps from CJ. Basically everything you need to get everything going. We went through and picked through everything she wanted in particularly. We just set up an RO system, water station. She wanted Ecotech lights, Apex. So I, we literally, I went from having no tanks to building a spawning system in essentially two days. A grow tent. And a grow tent to cover it all up. <laughs> <laughs> that came on like day four or five, that came later. And I set up infrared lights and used a wise camera with night vision so I could watch them if I wasn't at home or even make sure I wasn't because we don't even we didn't even know at this point do they spawn they could spawn during the daytime like some corals spawn during the daytime you can't sit there and watch the tank 24 hours a day so you need a camera backup system in case you're missing something and you know I'd have the apex shut the pump down at sunset and I'd try to make sure I'd be home from work before sunset so I could watch for, I watched them from the six o'clock sunset to about 10.30 every night for days and days and I don't even know how many hours, like just added up since I think we started watching them on October 26th, something like that. So there was a lot of watching and a lot of no spawning and acanthophilia are really annoying corals because they like swell up and then they close and then they poop, so they poop a lot, They're like the big polyp. And when that big polyp poops, it's like a significant amount of stuff coming out. Especially so you when you're not used to seeing a big don't, poop. We, and you don't stare at the big coral polyp all night long and you're like, wow, there's a lot of stuff coming out. Maybe that could be a spot. And you don't know how many times I took a pipette and pipetted up freaking poop and put it in a way boat and looked at it under the microscope and I'm like, yeah, there's nothing, that's poop. Or that looks like what I fed it yesterday. You did that um, at Biota. When you're in this mind of looking for coral spawning, it's easy to like mistake things because you're never looking this closely. You're staring at these corals. The yeah. infrared looks like, the infrared poop looks like spawn. Because you don't know what yeah. it looks like in the beginning, so you think every little thing is spawn. So the neighbors were coming over and checking the poop. On the, <laughs> the yeah. neighbors were coming over and checking False the alarm. poop. False alarm. False alarm. And then the Australians just took the thunder. I give it to them. Don and Lou, they had collected some acanthophilia from the northern portions of the Great Barrier Reef um, in September. They had this idea independently of us. Theirs spawned overnight. In a, in a bin, they, they weren't there to watch it. They were tired of watching it because it was like day 14 after the full moon of November. And then they come in in the morning and the bin that they had put the corals in had, had a bunch of eggs in it or what were actually developing embryos. So they, they won the, the race to be the first to get, to document the spawning. December full moon came around. December full moon was the day after Christmas. So started watching them very intently again the day after Christmas and every day since then. And then yesterday I got home from work. The tank lights must have just gone off and I went to check them and was just kind of looking around, nothing much was going on. And then I saw like a poof of something that I was like, oh, that kind of looks like a, like a spawn, like a sperm release. And I kind of did a double take, got, got my headlamp, got my phone out just, you know, in case. And sure enough, it, it did it again. And it, it was like a, almost like a volcano eruption really from one of the largest green colored acanthos in the tank. And it's one from the same shipment that this guy came from, 
with the eggs in the tissue. So the eggs went into three bins originally and at first I wasn't seeing any division. I'm like, oh, they're not gonna be fertilized. Uh, uh. I actually talked to Shane on the phone. He said, go eat food, stop looking at them. I'm like, okay, so he went and I made dinner and Delicious. I didn't look at them for like an hour and a half and I came back and there was cell division. So it was about 60% of them had been fertilized and started to divide. And they're starting to swim, which is really exciting. So I have like, a hundred acanthophilia larvae swimming around in the little bowl over there. Name Shane. Name Shane one, two, three, four, five, Shane Jr. Shane, 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 Shane. Shane spelled different ways. Um, and Carrie, Carrie Carrie's, one, two, three, four, Carrie five, and you can spell Carrie a lot of different yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Carrie Jr. and Richard Jr. Richard one, two, three, four, five. Richard Jr.'s dick. So we have to get these corals to settle first. Um, that's another big step. You know, like just getting the corals to spawn is honestly kind of the easiest part of the process. Um, it's getting the fertilization and the settlement and then raising the offspring. That's the hard part. Um, so we have about a hundred good looking larvae right now, and they'll probably go into their settlement container tomorrow. And then hopefully we'll have some primary polyps of acanthophilia here in the next couple days. Um, and then really wanting to just raise these guys up and, and make them available to the hobby for the first time, you know, captive raised acanthophilia that were, were not wild collected and, and show that it can be done and then keep improving on it. So the corals that I have now, you know, keeping some of those on a full cycle for the next year. So hopefully next year we get a much bigger, uh, more consistent spawn with a lot more offspring and trying to work on other species, the other species that are going to be harder to get from the wild and can't be fragmented very easily and making those readily available to hobbyists and making that a regular part of our industry so that we're not relying on wild collections. It is now 3.08 a.m. and some of us have to work tomorrow. So thanks for listening to our um, coral spawning saga and cross your fingers and toes for the future of these acantho babies and keep watching to see their settlement and development. But wait, there's more.